Good afternoon. This is Kim McCleary. I'm President and CEO of the CFIDS Association of America, and it's my privilege to welcome everyone to our 24th third webinar uh, in our series that began in 2010. And we're delighted to have you with us for today's program. And I apologize for the brief delay. We had some difficulties uh, connecting the audio. And as I had told Roger and Wilhelmina on uh, Monday, we've done about 30 of these now. And every time we have a new little uh, sniggle in, in the uh, technology connection. but. Um, be that as it may, we're ready to go now and, uh, again, are delighted to have everyone with us. I'm just going to start with a brief overview. And for many people who've registered for today's program, this is not your first webinar, but just to introduce those uh, for whom this is their first webinar. And, and Roger King, one of our guests, it's his first webinar, so he's going to have the benefit of this information as well. Um, as I mentioned, this is our 23rd webinar. We've archived most of the recordings, most all the recordings of past webinars on our YouTube channel. And you can find those and watch them at your leisure and as many times as you'd like on our Solve CFS YouTube channel. So that everyone understands um, how this works, uh, actually Roger King, Wilhelmina Jenkins, and I are in three different locations, and we can't see you, you can't see us, and we can't see one another. So unfortunately, we don't have the benefit of body language or hand signals to cue each other when one of us has a brilliant point they'd like to add to the conversation. So I hope everybody will bear with us as we um, try to make do with a three-way conversation with, with no help from visual cues. And um, I should also mention that um, for both Wilhelmina and Roger, this is their first time speaking on a webinar, so we're all getting used to um, this, this new technology and the format. To kind of guide our discussion, we will um, structure it around some of the themes that are common in Roger's novel, Love and Fatigue in America. And we'll talk more about the book in uh, just a moment. Um, and I know that about a quarter to a third of the people who'd registered for today have read the book or are in the process of reading the book. So we'll start with an overview and move into the themes um, that are described so beautifully in it. And just uh, to let everyone know, we are recording this. It looks like it's going smoothly. Um, we never know until it's over. And uh, hopefully, we'll have that posted online within a day or two. And we'll post a link both on the uh, registration page, where we provided some uh, background information about our guest today, and on our YouTube channel as well. And you'll receive an email after uh, the webinar within a day or so with that link. So um, you can share that with others or watch it again yourself. Now I'd like to introduce our guests. Um, do ladies first. Uh, Wilhelmina Jenkins. Um, Wilhelmina and I met at the first public meeting of the uh, CFS Coordinating Committee, which was the precursor to the CFS Advisory Committee that still meets today. We met uh, in 1993 in the ladies' room at the Centers for Disease Control. And it just goes to show you never know who you're going to meet in the ladies' room at the CDC. Um, she had just given some forceful testimony about the lack of research on CFS, particularly research involving racial minorities with CFS. And I can tell you at the time I met her, I had no idea how great her impact would be on my life and on the lives of so many people that I've met over the last 20 years. Uh, Wilhelmina was born in Washington, DC, and comes about her activism, I think, quite naturally. Um, as a college student, she was active in the civil rights movement. Uh, she was working on her PhD in physics and teaching physics and parenting two young children when CFS struck her life in 1983. She served as a member of the CFIDS Association's board from 1996 to 2000. And she and her daughter, Camila, who also has CFS, uh, appeared on Oprah's show in 1998 uh, as part of a panel of hard-to-diagnose uh, diseases. Wilhelmina was also one of our faces of CFS, her beautiful photograph there taken by um, fashion photographer George Lang, um, showed in many venues around the country, I think 45 venues, and was seen by millions of people in places like Union Station, um, the Salt Lake City Library there, uh, Mall of America, and many medical conferences as well. 
So welcome, Wilhelmina. Uh, Roger King is our other guest. Roger is the author of five novels, the latest of which is Love and Fatigue in America, which is uh, obviously the sort of the backdrop for our conversation today. He was born in the United Kingdom and came to the United States, and that's where the book begins. He lives now in Massachusetts, although I think is better traveled around America than probably most of us who've lived here all our lives. Um, before coming to America, he worked extensively in Asia and Africa and has worked as an economist and um, just a variety of fields. And in 1990, he uh, became suddenly ill with CFS. Um, he wrote about his illness over eight years, and the product of that work, uh, again, is the autobiographical novel, Love and Fatigue in America, published by University of Wisconsin Press in March of 2012. Welcome, Roger. Thank you, Kim. Very pleased to be here. So these are some of Roger's earlier works, the four novels that preceded Love in America, and also a documentary um, that's a, a prize-winning documentary set in a remote village in northeastern India. So and uh, because our conversation focuses on or starts with um, how their lives were uh, different from the, what they are now. I thought it was just kind of an interesting shot here of the two of them in settings um, in healthier, also younger days, but we all have younger days. <laughs> um, and let's see. I would also say about, about Roger, um, his our connection to CFS began around the same time. I joined the association in 1991. So as I was reading Love in America, I, I was sort of thinking of where I was at the time when you were writing uh, about it. And uh, it was the chapter titled Dr. 19 XIX uh, that anchored me instantly to the same moment in time you were writing about um, when you were describing the note you received from a physician who had decided to leave his medical practice to attend film school. And uh, immediately in that moment, I felt instantly bonded to you, um, having that same recollection of the doctor that shall go unnamed, Dr. Yeah, XIX. It was a show. Yeah. <laughs> So Wilhelmina, for the benefit of the uh, entire audience, but particularly those who aren't familiar with Love and Fatigue in America, would you share with us um, just an overview of the book? And you've reviewed it for goodreads.com um, so that folks have an idea of, of how the story unfolds and, and what to expect. I thought this was a wonderful, wonderful book to start with. Uh, I'm a reader. I'm, this is... What, what was one of the things that was most important to me all of my life. I've read books forever. Reading was one of the things I lost with this illness for many, many, many years. And when I got it back, I became voracious in reading everything I could get my hands on practically. But I'm very picky about books. I like books to be beautifully written. I like books that, that engage you. This book has everything for me. It's a wonderful book that I could enjoy on so many levels as a reader, just in, in terms of a wonderful book, but also as a person with this illness. What Roger does is he takes his skills as a writer, which are, are wonderful, and he uses so many different techniques. He comes at it from so many directions to describe this illness. This illness, is, as everybody on the line probably knows, is extremely diff difficult to describe in a straightforward manner because the illness itself is so complicated and confusing. Roger manages to make that an advantage in this book. He, he comes at it from many different directions, from lists, from, from uh, short descriptions, from all kinds of different directions, from poetry. He manages to come at it so many different ways that you get a whole feel of the illness. I find it very hard to believe that anybody who has had this illness would not find many, many things to identify with. And I find it hard to believe that any reader who knew nothing about this illness, wouldn't come away understanding how truly complex and life-crushing it is. The honesty of Roger's description, he doesn't spare himself. Sometimes, I know many of us, myself included, will cover up a little bit. We try to make ourselves look a little bit better than we really are. Roger puts it all out there and puts it all on the line. And all of the quiet, painful moments, as well as the, the 
more public moments that we go through with this illness are all right there in Roger's book, and I, I thank him for that. It made the whole story that we all go through very, very clear, and I feel that many people who don't understand this illness, if they read Roger's book, will understand it quite well. Great. Thank Thank you so much, <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Can we stop this? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> well, and I think it's, uh, you know, as well received as I know the book has been among the people uh, whose lives have been touched by, touched or crushed by CFS uh, that I know. I, I think it's also important the, the great uh, reviews from people who don't have any connection to the illness, and we've included just pieces of two of them here, one from Publishers Weekly and one from uh, Ray Francoeur for Gatehouse News Service that's been in uh, several papers. Um, so I think the um, critical acclaim is important in terms of helping other people, as you said, Wilhelmina, understand what this illness is really like because it is so tough to describe in a few brief sentences. So, Roger, I know that um, as an author, you're accustomed to doing readings as a feature of the author events in which you've participated, both with this book and other books. And uh, would you honor us with a short selection um, from Love and America, sure. Love and Fatigue in America? Yeah, this will be a, a very short uh, selection, so a minute or two. And uh, as Wilhelmina said, the, the book is written in... Uh, several different styles, there's, uh, there's narrative and there's essay and there's poetry and there's lists and it jumps around. This is a sort of verse and the title of this short chapter is How to Be Ill. You know how to be ill. You are plucky and cheerful. You do not complain. You maintain a genuine interest in the lives and problems of others. <clears throat> even when these problems are clearly of a lesser order. You laugh at yourself. You overcome your disabilities to shine in spite of them. You have great spirit. You're an inspiration to all and trouble to none. You transcend. <laughs> By contrast, those who do not know how to be ill remind others of how they feel, whine, become cantankerous, and impose their ill fortune on all around them, spreading emotions of sympathy, guilt, and disgust. You deplore such people. The ideal sick person is paralyzed, but with a brilliant brain and a big heart. He or she has huge disadvantages, yet is winning through personality intact. A clear course towards death is an advantage for the high-achieving invalid. The legs are amputated. The end is imminent. <laughs> the mind blazes with a selfless wisdom. Sufferers from chronic fatigue syndrome are not good at being ill. You look well. You're not dying. Your complaint is modest. You're going to be troubled for a long time. Your brain does not work. Your charm has gone with it. You're inconsistent, sometimes perversely well. You're unreliable. You explain your unreliability, which is like whining. You cannot explain your illness. You're inconvenient, thoughtless, borelish, charmless, witless, and you don't do your share. You are not yourself. There is no place for people who are not themselves. You are not good at being ill. You will lose all your friends. You may kill yourself because of this. And that is the end of the chapter. Thank you, Roger. Um, you should know that I had dog-eared those pages even before I knew they were the <laughs> ones you would choose to read uh, because it is such an apt description. Uh, choice, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Long before I met, <laughs> you had any idea I'd be on this webinar. <laughs> so let uh, let's talk about um, let's go to the themes and life as each of you had imagined it um, before CFS struck. Um, I've asked our guests to be ready in turn to talk about these things. And love and fatigue in America starts with the hopeful arrival of our protagonist, Roger. Uh, on American soil, eager to make a new life. And Roger, if you could share with us, what was the life you imagined as you landed in Spokane? Um, and then we'll ask Wilhelmina about her life at the time before CFS hit. 
Well, you know, I just uh, I'd uh, just turned 40 a little while before, and um, I'd had a, a life based in London mainly when I was working for the United Nations, and I'd been traveling around the world. Um, uh, rural poverty was my interest, and I'd also been uh, uh, writing novels, my first three novels, and um, I thought I wasn't writing them fast enough, and I thought I needed to concentrate on being a writer, and so I decided that I'd come to America and make this new life as a writer, and very conveniently, a university in Spokane invited me to come over to be a visiting professor of writing. Um, <clears throat> so I had uh, great hopes. I had a, an American girlfriend, and it seemed like the future was pretty much uh, set. Um, I would come over. I'd be more productive and more successful and, and uh, have a family and, um, and really uh, build on the earlier years in my middle years. And, uh, of course, uh, it didn't quite work out that way, but that's what I expected. I, I, I expected to, to do more, and I, I'd written three novels in the last previous ten years while I've been working around the world, and I thought that wasn't enough. <laughs> uh, you know, in, the, in 20 years since, I've written two novels, so <laughs> in fact, looking back, it now looks like I, I was doing okay, but I didn't think I was. I thought yeah. I could do much more. And... Uh... You know, we I think we think of uh, that sort of overachiever attitude as something that's uniquely American, but you didn't have the uh, cultural incentive um, coming from outside the country for that. Well, you don't know it's overachieving. You know, you, you just, I mean, you don't know your, your limits. You just right. You, you're doing what you can do, and uh, then you get a rude surprise. Yeah. You have no idea what you can lose. The things that you lose, you have no idea. You, those are things that are possible for a human being to lose. <laughs> That's absolutely right. Yes, you just take it for granted. Mm -hmm. I took my health for granted. And I thought that if I wanted to do something more, I just had to to try harder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's hold that thought and ask Wilhelmina, what was your life like as you were finishing your Ph.D. parenting two small children in 1983? I always say that 1983 started out as one of the best years of my life and rapidly turned into one of the worst. At the beginning of 1983, I was having a really wonderful time. I was at Howard University in Washington, D.C. I had done all but a little bit more research for my Ph.D., and I was starting to write things up. I was working with a wonderful research group at the National Bureau of Standards, which is now the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Gaithersburg, Maryland. They were a great group of people. I was having great fun doing research with them. We were doing fun work with lasers that I was using for my dissertation work. I had just, my appointment that year for the first time was not even a graduate school appointment. I was actually a faculty member that year. And I taught upper level undergraduate physics courses for the first time. And I had great students who would come in every day rushing to the board before I could get there, ready to tackle problems. It was so much fun. Uh, my children were great. My, well, my son was 13, so he was a typical 13-year-old. My, <laughs> my daughter was, was six years younger. They were great kids, wonderful people. I could picture my life very, very clearly as to what I was going to be doing. I thought I would teach forever. I did not see myself ever retiring in life. I thought I would keep teaching until I fell over with the chalk in my hand. I had the fun goal of wanting to encourage more African-American women to go into physics. There aren't many. And it's largely because it's not something that a lot of young black women think of. And I knew that when, I, when they saw me, their view of things would change. And all that I had to do was get out there, talk to them, find the ones for whom this would really hit a spark and, and we'd be on a roll. I could picture doing that forever. I, I worked on a committee that year to increase the number of, of African Americans in physics. I organized a conference there at Howard. It, it was really a superb year for about a month and a half. Mm. In February of 1983, everything ground to an abrupt halt for me. It, it, I did not write the, the date down on the calendar. It was mid-February. I could have. I could have circled the day. I knew exactly when everything left. 
And for me, it was a moment of, uh-oh, many people like Roger, and he'll talk about it in a minute, I'm sure, have a clear virus first. I may have had one that I didn't notice. I was sailing along very happily, but I did not notice a virus. What I noticed was all at once a feeling of having dropped through the bottom of the earth. And the most shocking thing of all was that all of a sudden my brain no longer worked. The work I'd been working on looked as foreign to me as if somebody had done it on another planet. I couldn't recognize anything that I was doing. I was physically completely wiped out. I could not sleep at night. I could not get up in the morning. I got lost everywhere I was trying to go. It was a total shock. This is a shocking illness, as so many of you know I know. It, it takes you to places you never thought you could fall to. And it, it was a totally stunning experience. Roger, tell us about your sudden onset. Uh, well, I, uh, I think I did have this, this flu-like experience that Wilhelmina mentioned. Uh, um, but, um, you know, it didn't, I didn't really pay any attention to it. I was finishing a book to deadline. I was teaching at the same time. And I, the fever was, was really just something I used to, to work a bit harder. I, I, I kind of had lots of fevers in the past because I, I worked a lot in Africa and I had malaria and so on. So I, I gave it no particular uh, importance and uh, I recovered from it like one does from flu. And about two weeks later, I thought it was time to get back in shape. So I went back to the gym and uh, started to lift a few weights. And then suddenly um, I just became very weak. I couldn't see properly. I couldn't stand up. I, I just had to sit down leaning against the wall and was dizzy and I just didn't know what was happening. It was, it was, uh, it was like gravity had suddenly increased tenfold. But you know, you don't, uh, you, you think it's temporary. Um, just thought I was having a, a bad spell and I'd be all right the next day. And you know, the next week I thought I'd be all right the next month. And uh, um, you don't, of course, know that you're getting along term illness and I'd been ill before and thought I'd just get better again but it um, it turned out not to be the case of course as everybody on this webinar knows and um, and as well Amina says you know it was a, a, a daily learning experience of not being able to think straight not being able to stand up just trying to make sense of something trying to find patterns trying to find causes and not really being able to make sense of it. Because I, I think that's what we all try to do. We try to make sense. Because if you make sense of things, you get a feeling you can control them. And part of the frustration of the illness was like, I couldn't make sense of it. It seemed like I'd do something one day and I'd feel better. I'd do the same thing another day. I'd feel worse. And I think that wish to make sense of it and the, the difficulty of making sense of it has been a, you know, a constant experience for the, the 20 years, 20 odd years since I, I first became ill. I, I, when I read your, your description of what happened to you in the gym, Roger, I, I really identified with that. I had been taking aerobics classes. One of them ended in January, another one started in March. In January, I was happily bouncing along and doing all the dance steps. This was the first group I'd ever been in where I actually knew the dance steps. So it, <laughs> it was fun for me. This is, I had a great time with it. I had looked forward to the new session in, in March. When I went, went in in March and attempted to do the same thing I did in January, I found myself in five minutes leaning against the wall collapse. And I had no, uh, no idea what, what, what in the world was wrong. It was the craziest thing I had ever experienced. It, and I agree wholeheartedly with the making sense thing. I, I was in science. My parents were scientists. My husband's a scientist. We're all scientists. We try to yeah. make sense out of everything. This was an illness that I could make <laughs> no sense out of whatsoever. It just defies explanation, doesn't it? It does, it does force acceptance on you in the end, which yep. may be a good life. Yes. So, so Roger, there are several places in the book where you describe your vantage point from various horizontal um, positions, from couches, from beds, even how you must position yourself in the driver's seat when you make your cross-country journey. 
uh, by car. Um, what are the, some of the ways in which you've learned to accommodate uh, a less active, more horizontal life over these 20 years? Um, well, a lot of lying down is involved. And, you know, there's, I think at the beginning it was more, you know, lying down after I could no longer stand up. And now it's um, lying down in, in preparation for doing something. I've, I've learned more to, um, to uh, sort of build up my reserves before doing something. But I, I had, that was not a concept I had early on. You know, I try and do as much as I could, and if I felt better, I'd try to do even more, then I'd get sick again. Now I have sort of um, preventative lying down. <laughs> um, but it, it's, uh, you know, for, for example, um, you know, writing, uh, I think somebody asked about how I could write when I was ill. Um, but, you know, that's all done in bed, and it's, um, it's all done um, longhand, because I found that sitting at a keyboard and sitting in a chair is much more tiring than, than lying with your feet up in bed writing uh, with a pen. And, and this is the, the <laughs> insights into the human body you get all the time with this illness. You know exactly what takes more energy and causes more stress mm -hmm. than, than some other thing. And, you know, a lot of what I, I wrote over the years has been complete rubbish because, um, you know, your brain isn't always working very well. Um, so I just let that happen and hoped that I'd get some better pages at some point. Um, and, I, and when it was really bad, towards the beginning, I actually dictated um, uh, writing into a cassette recorder and had somebody else uh, uh, type, type it up, um, which uh, continued for a little while until the, uh, the typist's uh, son uh, erased everything <coughs> and and I, I stopped that method oh. but, um, <laughs> yeah it was painful <laughs> yeah it, it, it was painful but you know I really don't remember caring too much <laughs> that's mm -hmm. I think it's, it's hard to you know to care too much about things like that when you're uh, you're spending your time sort of monitoring your day and uh, just trying to get through it Roger, one thing, another thing that struck me in your book was both you and I were trying to teach our way through this illness, which you kept trying to teach right. in spite of it. I know I tried from 1983 to 1987 to continue to teach, and teaching was always the one thing, no matter how I felt. If I was tired, if I was sad, whatever was going on in my life, when I walked into the classroom, I was ecstatic. I loved teaching. It was a great joy to me. And one of the saddest days of my life was when I realized I could not do this any longer. And uh, you described very well in your book the point where you just can't do it any, any longer either. It's teaching it actually gives you some flexibility. So you think that maybe, maybe you can work around this illness. Maybe you can find some way to hold on to it a little bit longer. Physics was gone for me very fast at higher level physics, my own research. I never got back to the point where my own research made any sense to show you how ridiculous it was. I can remember exactly one day in 1991 when I went to a library and my brain was working well enough that I could read the titles in, a, in the journals I used to publish in. And I was so happy. And it lasted exactly one day and it hasn't happened again since. But that was all gone for me. But I, I tried as hard as I could to hold on to teaching because those were things that were so ingrained in me I thought I could keep being able to communicate them to others. But it was impossible. You had one seat in your book where you were trying to teach with your head lying down on the desk. And I said, yes, I understand that quite well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, things were getting bad at that stage. But I can imagine being a physicist, that sort of intense mental reasoning, I would think would be the, the most difficult of all mental activities. Uh, it was gone. Yeah, but there was happened. no hope for that. Mm -hmm. There was no hope, yeah. and it hasn't. It's never come back. It's, it's heartbreaking. One of my most heartbreaking days was when I was in, I guess that was early 1990s, when I was sitting in a room with some of my friends who had come in town for a conference, and everybody around him, including my husband, was discussing physics, and I was going, please let me go lie down. That was all I wanted to do, because I couldn't understand anything that was going on around me, and all I wanted to do was to get back in bed. And that was yeah. a sad day. Yes. Yeah. 
I, I must say that, that, that teaching, um, I, I found the problem with teaching is having to turn up on time. Um, you know, that mm -hmm. I never knew when I win my health is going to be better or, or worse. And you have to be there at a certain time to teach whatever state you're in. And, I, I, you know, since then I've tried to do things that allow me to do them when I can do them and not do them when I can't do them, to mm -hmm. just do things that allow me to manage my time. I think. And that was, uh, you know, that was the sad thing about teaching. That, that was heartbreaking to me. Well, Amina, what, what are some of the things you've learned um, to accommodate this horizontal life? I think what I learned most is to just take what my body has to give me on any given day. Uh, I mentioned reading earlier. I had years when I could not read, and I was bedridden. And I know there are many people online at the moment who have been in that condition too, and there is nothing on earth more boring than being bedridden and unable to read uh -oh. or, or I think we may have lost Wilhelmina. Oh dear, can you not hear uh, me? It's weird. I, I can hear Oops. her, uh, Kim. Uh, yeah, yep, no, there we go. Have you got me? That was and something. <laughs> <laughs> something weird uh, happened. Um, but it's okay now? Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you a little better. Yeah. Okay. I was I was just saying that I I have learned just to take whatever my body gives me on any given day, because you never know exactly what you're going to be able to do. At the point where I was bedridden for several years, there, I got down to the point where I had a coloring book and a box of sixty four crayons, and I colored because that was all I could do with myself. And if anybody touched my box of 64 crayons, they were in trouble, too. <laughs> Those were my crayons, and that was what I had to work with. Uh, it's very hard to keep your sense of self when you don't know exactly what you're going to have to work with at any given time. And you have to go day by day, sometimes hour by hour. One of, the, one of my favorite dark humor jokes about CFS is, is the one that most people have heard of, which is, you know, event starts at 9, RSVP at 8.45, because you don't know what you're going to be able to do. You, you hope, you try, you make your best effort, but there's nothing that says what you're going to be able to do in the afternoon by looking at the morning. You just do the best you can, and that's hard to explain to people. It's hard not to feel unreliable. It's hard not to blame yourself. So you do feel like you should be just trying harder. I, I beat myself up for years, and I learned not to beat myself up. It's a terrible thing to, to be cruel to yourself when, the, when your body is being so cruel to you anyway. So you have to learn, get yeah. to the point where you can, can be kind to yourself. I always say be as kind to yourself as you would be to your best friend if this happened to her. And that's a hard thing to learn. Yeah, I think that's that is particularly hard, you know, especially when you're tr in a new place trying to make friends. This, you know, I, I there have been a number of occasions where I've been invited somewhere and I've accepted, and uh, then not been able to go. And you, you know, you call up and explain, and people say they understand, but I've, I've noticed that you might not get invited again. <laughs> yeah. You know, they they it somehow it uh, they register it as being unreliable even though they consciously um, you know are, are sympathetic Roger one uh, of the I, things I, I that, one of the things I found most interesting in your book because I already had my children and things was was you're trying to build a family life with an illness that left you unable to fulfill the requirements of a family life that was very touching to me in this book and I, I know that that must be even hard for you to talk about but that's something that, especially for a man, I think was a new viewpoint for me, for a man to, to try to actually build a, a life with, with a, a mate and a child and know that you did not have everything to work with that you should have in order to do that. Yes, and, uh, and, and, and you must have more experience than me of, uh, of, of having children while you're ill. But yeah, it, it was, um, you know, making a new relationship in a new place. And so there were always, 
you know, calculations. Um, um, you know, what are you, what are you going to choose to do? Are you going to choose to uh, help with the cooking in the evening, or are you going to choose to to play with um, uh, the, the the child, or you know, dare you make love because going to ruin you for the rest of the day. You know, what it, you have to calculate, you know, what is most important for sustaining uh, uh, the relationship? And you just can't do it all. You can't really do your share as much as you'd like to give the other person. And I think with a child, of course, who you can't really expect to, to understand what's happening to you, uh, that tends to have to come first. I, I was you know, living with a child, you know, when she was six, seven, eight, and, uh, and it seemed to me that it, the most important thing was that I be reliable for her and uh, do the things that we usually did together every day. And and uh, if everything else fell apart, at least I, I would do that. So you set a set of priorities, and but you can never do enough to really fully sustain a, a relationship in the way you'd like to. My daughter was How did you? eight when I became ill, too. So if, I know exactly what you mean. Uh, the worst thing, of course, with my daughter, is, as some people know, is that my daughter also has this illness. And that's something that I never even dreamed was going to happen. I knew that there were people who had family incidences, but I looked at the people in my own support group and the people that I knew personally, and it, it looked very unlikely. Most people I knew had healthy children. It was going okay, and, I, and my daughter was bouncy and full of energy and was at the time she became ill, she was in high school, she was a sophomore, she was on the drill team, she was always active in social life, and abruptly in December she began coming in into the house, she, she's 14, 15, 14 or 15, I'm sorry, I know numbers are not good at the moment, but um, she came in the house and began to collapse on the couch, and I was in denial completely. Other people had to point out to me that her symptoms were looking exactly like mine because I, it was the most horrible thing of my life to realize that my daughter had the same thing that I had. And my biggest fear in life, of course, was that she would be as disabled as I. I've been disabled since 1987. And the thought of her being disabled was more than I could stand. So that was where I did put most of my energy. That I put all of my energy in trying to keep her Welcome to GoToWebinar, Web Events Made Easy. This is because she couldn't stay awake. She was, I remember she completely slept through her geometry final, no way, to, no way to pass a class, so we had to figure out a way to get her able to make it through high school. College was very interesting because, of course, she, my husband taught at a college right up the street from us, and she was, I was able to drive her up for a class pick her up for a, from a class, take her home, give her medicine, give her food, let her rest, let me rest, and then we do it again for the next class. But my energy did go towards trying to prevent my daughter from getting any worse than she absolutely had to. It was a scary, scary, terrible thing. It's one of the things that made me, uh, Kim mentioned that, that I was speaking out at the meeting where we met, but when my daughter became ill, I became furious. <laughs> at the time, they were saying, all sorts of very stupid things about this illness that make now look good. I mean, at the time, they were saying African Americans didn't get this illness, and they actually had a whole long list of reasons why that was true, as in oh African Americans are, just, are exposed to viruses at an early age, therefore they would not be subject to something like this. And I, I, I was utterly incensed. Uh, the first doctor I took my daughter to was a, an insane person who when I took my daughter in and her blood pressure was unmeasurable from the first three people who tried it and when the doctor finally got it, it was 60 over 40, she looked up at me and said, perhaps you should go to a psychiatrist. I did not commit murder. <laughs> I'm not in jail. I got out in one piece and we, we found a good doctor. But I, things that I could bear for myself, I could not bear for my daughter. So you, you had to give up a lot of your own life to make yeah. sure that she had a, a life. Didn't have that much life <laughs> anyway, but yes, <laughs> that was okay yeah. as long as things. And, and uh, I'm always thankful to Dr. David Bell because he wrote so much about 
children and this illness, and I just followed everything he said. Even things that he took back later, it was okay, because <laughs> it helped us get through those first years where we just didn't know what was going to happen. So if I can jump back in, we're, we're kind of making a nice segue into the fourth theme, um, the medical world. And Roger writes a lot about this uh, in the book and makes some observations about the individual doctors that he sees along the way and also the medical system that all of us are trapped in here in the United States um, that serves most of us poorly no matter what our diagnosis is, I think. Um, both of you were diagnosed relatively early in your illness, especially considering, you know, the year in which each of you got sick and when even less information existed about CFS. And most doctors were unaware and many of them were, um, uh, what's the nicest way to say this, um, <laughs> agnostic <laughs> about, about the, the label and the diagnosis. Um, even so, both of you have had some remarkably bad encounters, and Wilhelmina just shared one that related more to um, Camila's uh, diagnosis than her own. And I wonder how each of you approach health care now. How do you think of um, the care you seek and, and whether you're getting good care or bad care in the face of this uh, uncertain diagnosis and the lack of knowledge that still exists in the medical system about it. So Roger, maybe you can start us off. Yes. Um, well, I, you know, I, I think at some point in the book, I, I have a couple of pages that say no need to read. And they're just lists of the, um, the treatments and the, and the medicines I've taken over the years, which is far too long a list. And, and really, um, I'm not sure that any of them had a, a significant uh, effect. I've always been willing to try the latest one, um, but uh, and I am better for more of the time now than I was at the beginning. But I can't really associate it with any any uh, particular treatment. And I think my my you know to begin with, you're used to being in charge of your life and you used to. You know, but well, I mean, in ourselves, you know, we've educated, we, we, we have something of a science background, and and so you you try to take charge, and you say, well, you know, other people might be a victim of this, but I'm going to I'm going to you know sort it out, and I'm going to find the right doctors, and I'm going to find the latest treatments, and I'm going to do all the research, and I'm going to take charge of this illness and beat it, and and so I went around to lots and lots of doctors in the first years and all sorts, alternative practitioners and nutcases and uh, doctors of various types. And um, I think in recent years, I've, I've slowed down. I, I do still uh, you know, see a doctor. Um, I don't go so much to the doctors who offer a lot of treatments, because I find that there's always new treatments on offer, and they usually cost me a lot of money, and they usually don't make any difference. So I, I, I don't spend so much time keeping up with it now as I used to. I feel like I will hear um, about a good new treatment when there, when there is one, or an advance in the understanding when there is one. But I think I decided that I wanted to um, not put too much of my energy there and put as much of my energy as I could into other things like, like writing about it, right, writing this book, and um, uh, and just make as uh, as much as I could of the energies and, and abilities that I that I still had. I didn't really continue to believe that putting all my energy into seeking treatments was was going to be that uh, productive for me. So now I just see doctors, but I don't chase doctors. In my case, it really did take me five years to get diagnosed. I, I got sick in 83. I got my diagnosis in 88. And I got it in a kind of a strange way, because after five years with this illness, no surprise, I was depressed. So, And I was probably the jolliest depression, depressed person you'd ever <laughs> want to see, because my reaction was, aha, something that's treatable. So I trotted into the doctor and said, hello, I'm depressed. 
let's treat this. Mm. And I was lucky mm. enough to get a psychiatrist who treated the depression and then looked at the rest of my symptoms and says, I said, I know what you have. At that time, that was just after the name of this illness, haven't helped the name, but and it actually had a name and a, and a write-up at that point that was done, a uh, horrible name though it is. And therefore, people here in the Atlanta area where, where the CDC is located were at least becoming aware of it. And I was lucky enough to get a psychiatrist who said, no, you're not crazy, you're sick. And who sent me to someone who, uh, if I started naming doctors, I, I, I want to leave their names out too, just as you did, Roger, but a doctor who knew what the illness was but wasn't much help at all, to say the least. Uh, I didn't really get a doctor who was able to do anything much to help me until after my daughter became ill. And at that point, I was screaming at the insurance company, you have to send me to Dr. Bell, I don't care what you say. And they asked me to try one doctor here in Atlanta, and that's the doctor we still have, Dr. Richard Prokash, and he's the one who I, be I give lots and lots and lots of credit to him for getting my daughter through to the point she is now, and she's not well, and I probably didn't mention that. Of course, she's not well, but she's functioning. I have two wonderful grandchildren, and of course, that's the upside. The, the scary part is that I always wonder, as my older grandchild gets closer and closer to adolescence, if the same thing will happen to him as happened to his mother. In terms of my own treatment, uh, my doctor is very willing to try things, too, and I, but I'm... I tend to want to wait for, for the research. I, this is, I know my science background, but from the time I knew what I had, I tried to look at the research that was going on. And at the time, this is, I got my diagnosis in 88, so I'm looking at 88, 89, 90. The research was a nightmare. This was the worst bunch of so-called research I ever saw in my life. At the meeting that Kim mentioned where we met, I brought a notebook to take notes before I was going to stand up and, and say what I had to say. And all I had written in my, that notebook was bad science, bad science, bad science, straight down the page because it was so yeah. atrocious. I remember one particular talk that was given in which someone tried to graph out the number of symptoms we have and make a cutoff line and said, if you have five or fewer symptoms, you may be really sick. But if you have above five <laughs> symptoms, it's all psychiatric. And I'm sitting there with my head in my hands ready to scream because it was so bad. I've continued to want some sol solid science behind whatever, whatever treatments I'm going to do because I do still feel like the one thing I can do is to give my daughter some support so she can keep going and help with my grandchildren whenever I can. I don't want to do anything that will make me lose that. Uh, I, it's, I'm too subject to losing it anyway. I've been on the slide for about a year and a half now. And I, the thing about being on the slide is you never know where the bottom is. I don't want to do anything to make myself fall down any further than I have to until I'm, I'm sure that my grandchildren are not going to need anything from me. I can't do much, but I actually, we talked about what makes you make it through the days. I learned a lot about unconditional love from having grandchildren. Roger, you had a lot of unconditional love from your pet, and that is not unusual for people <laughs> with this illness. That you, having somebody who gives you unconditional love, whether it's a, a pet or a grandchild or something, means a lot. And I learned that that I could play with my grandson without moving and still have fun. And that, that was probably one of the best things I ever learned after having this illness. I couldn't move around like other grandmas. I'm never going to be the grandma who takes you to the mall. I'm never going to be the grandma who takes you to Disney World. I'm never going to be the grandma who even bakes cookies. I, can, I have had second degree burns last year from trying to warm up a piece of toast in the oven. But, <laughs> And I can be the grandma who has an imagination, and I can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'd like to add a bit more about doctors, because you, you reminded me of my first diagnosis. I, I, I was diagnosed very quickly uh, by a, a doctor because of his ignorance. He, um, he found I had Epstein-Barr virus, and he had heard somewhere that caused uh, mm -hmm. a disease, a RFT syndrome, and, and so he diagnosed me right away, and uh, of course, it turned out that that was a false <laughs> reasoning, but uh, but it, it stuck anyway. 
Um, mm -hmm. And I, I, he wasn't a very good doctor. He, he, I called him grumpy in the book. Um, <laughs> but, um, but I think that, you know, it's, this is difficult for most doctors. Uh, you know, I think it's, we're in a system where it's really quite difficult for them to help even if they want to because they're, they're, they're stuck in a system where uh, they are brought up with the idea that, that illnesses have clear symptoms and a clear cause and, and, a, and a clear treatment and their insurance companies want them to have short visits with patients, the drug companies want them to give a prescription at, at the end and they're sort of locked into that system and when you, when you get illnesses like ours which uh, are very complicated in the way they affect the body, body systems and very varied between people and within the same person uh, there's many factors involved. They just they're not prepared by training to to uh, to look at illnesses that way. Most of them, and they don't have the time uh, to do it. They're under this pressure themselves. Um, so I I, I ha they have some sympathy, and I think the ones who uh, you know manage to take themselves out of that system sometimes at their personal cost. Uh, you know, are real are real heroes. I, I agree. It's, it's difficult. I, I was always willing. I had a lot of kind doctors when I first became ill, but they had no clue. They had no That's clue right. as to what was wrong with me. They were willing to check stuff. They knew I was sick. It was quite clear that this was a terrible physical illness, that things were going on with me that were just unimaginable, but they had no clues to what to do with it. I'm always willing to accept I don't know. If they if they just don't do any harm, it's the ones that do harm that I get angry about. And I I've been luckier than, about that than most, but I've had close friends who've had doctors who've been just just cruel and unkind. And I have a tendency to get angry for others more than I get angry for myself. And I do get angry with those doctors. I do think I went to a, doc, a, a doctor with a, a close friend once, and I I think I pigeonholed the doctor afterwards and told her a few things. <laughs> Fortunately, she didn't call the guard. But <laughs> it, it's right. very frustrating when you have doctors who are, are unkind. As long as they admit that they're things they don't know and are willing to learn, that's all I can ask. It, this is a hard illness. It is a hard illness. And right. the, just, just the understanding how severe it is, how terrible this illness is, uh, some of the things we've heard recently, particularly from, from England, about the cruelty of treatment of especially a, a number of young women, some of whom have died, it, it, it just is unbearable to me to listen to, to the fact that they could be so cruel. All they need to do is to say, I don't know, let's treat what we can right. treat. Let's take care of your symptoms and take care of you and protect you until we know more. And they don't do that. The ones who don't do that, to me, are beyond the pale. <laughs> that's that's a terrible right. thing to me. Yes, doctors Roger. are not trained to say they don't know. No, no. they're not. R Roger has a, a short chapter, and all the chapters in the book are short for those who haven't read it, um, titled Doctors. And if you mm -hmm. indulge me reading these two sentences, I think they are uh, so illustrative of our medical system today. Um, he writes, this makes them sad, brave, and comic, the balance depending largely on how brashly they attempt to cloak their limitations with authority. They live at one remove from reality and one remove from love, and this causes them distress. And I thought that was so poignantly written. Um, and through my own experience, even though I don't have CFS as a, as a diagnosis. Yeah, when, uh, one of the reasons I love my doctor that I have now so much is because when I walked in, I walked in ready for a battle with my daughter, and he saw what I was carrying in with me, which happened to be the Seafoods Chronicle at the time. He looked at it, he said, oh, I see you have the latest one. I know how severe this illness is. I hope that we'll be able to do something to help you. And I, I began to say, I don't care about me, just take care of my daughter. He said, no, both of you. This is a terrible illness, and we want to do whatever we can. And he had, uh, that was it. That's all I needed. And we've tried things since then. Like Roger, I don't think I've had much success with any of my treatments. At least I've had some success with, with treatments of sleep disorder and, and a little bit with pain and a few other small things, but not much success. But he's willing to try, and I know that when the current research 
produces some better results, he'll be right there for me. And that's I, I can't ask any more than that. Uh, I, I also like, like to just mention, uh, you know, the complexity of doctors getting involved with the disability insurance uh, business. Uh, because um, that's really where I've probably had the most difficult experience with doctors. I was on disability for a while. <clears throat> I took myself off it. But it, um, <clears throat> they, they have, um, my disability company like, with the university I was at, has a, a clause in it that says that if the illness is psychological, they needn't pay. But if it's physical, they need to pay. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is absurd because it's like, isn't, isn't the same blood going through your brain as your body? <laughs> you know, aren't, aren't, aren't your nerves connected? Um, uh, but it's so it's a, a ridiculous philosophical question. But because there's so much at stake for the insurance company, um, uh, they're willing to go to quite some lengths to try to find doctors who will take this position of it, of it being a psychological illness. And I must admit that they, they didn't, in the end, get anywhere with, the, with this, with, with me. But um, there are doctors who, you know, who are willing to take the money and uh, who have that, those views, and the insurance companies seek them out. And in my case, uh, even to the extent of an insurance company, insurance company hiring a limousine to drive me to another state to see a doctor who had once said that um, chronic fatigue syndrome was uh, depression. And uh, <laughs> they, they sent me all the way there, and then the doctor had changed his mind uh, <laughs> yeah. by, by, by the whole thing. <laughs> but it does uh, you know, indicate um, the length that they, that they will go and how this distorts um, uh, medical opinion, because these doctors are, are you know, in the pay of the insurance companies. Hello. Now, I I have been disabled too since since 1987, and I'm, I'm I came to the Social Security Disability System, and it was insane. And the one thing I always say to people who are trying to get disability is that they should not ever stop trying because <laughs> they want to wear you down. They do try to wear you down. I can imagine exactly what you went through there. <laughs> yeah. So. <clears throat> It was hard, and it was also comic. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm mindful of your energy levels, uh, Wilhelmina and Roger, and I'm mindful of our uh, audience's energy levels. And mm -hmm. you know, no, we could talk about those two topics, doctors and disability, for another hour yet. But um, oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, let's let's uh, sort of shift gears a bit and, and talk about the redefinition of self. And that seems to be something that um, is a continuous process in the face of aging, in the face of illness, in the face of a life uh, that script gets rewritten for any number of reasons. Um, how have you redefined yourself and your life in the face of this illness? Wilhelmina? I had to really do a lot of redefinition because I think if you had asked anybody who knew me the top ten things they think of right off the bat when they thought of me, I lost all of them, <laughs> and they were just not where I could redefine myself anymore. Uh, even something as simple as being a reader. I read from the time I was three. I didn't know how to be a person who couldn't read. I loved mathematics my whole life, and mathematics was gone. So much was gone. I had to really look very hard to see what was left. I, I did something as drastic as I would, I would take out my pictures of myself when I was one and two and three, and I would look at them and I would say, I am the same person. This has, this is the same person. What, what do I still have that I had then? Who am I that I was then? And I had to, to look very hard to find what those things were. And uh, you have to stop defining yourself in terms of what you can do. Teacher would have been very high on my list. Scientists would have been very high. There were there were a lot of things that would have been very high that were just gone forever. And well, I won't say forever because I I retain hope, but they've been gone for a very 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 long time now, almost 30 years for me. And uh, I did find things that were still left. And I tend to be 
a compassionate person, and now I can't go out and do things physically to help people, but I can still listen to people. And you have to find a way to, to be compassionate without being active. You have to find a way to be an activist without being active. I was an activist <laughs> most of my life. How do you become an activist when you're not active? And there are ways. There are things that you can do. In terms of this illness, uh, I have I've done things to try to spread awareness of this illness whenever I can. But I know there are limits. That I can, I'm never going to be able to pick up a picket sign and walk up and down in front of the CDC. But uh, occasionally I can write a letter, or occasionally I can I can tell my story. I think our stories end up being very powerful. Roger, your story is so powerful. I think being able to tell our stories is a, a thing to do for an activist. Uh, I really treasured the time I worked with the Seafoods Association, although I became too ill to continue it, because it gave me a way to not only remember who I was as an activist, but also to help you know, fight for help for all of us with this illness. And I think uh, we see that. We see people who are bedridden but nevertheless manage to do things for others and to, to reaffirm who they are themselves. Uh, you can't let this illness take away who you are. I always say I refuse to give this illness anything it can't take away. I'm not going to become a different person. I'm, gonna, I'm never going to be able to do the things I used to do, but I have to remember that I'm the same person I always was. I just have to find a new approach. And it, it's hard. This is very, very hard. This, this illness humiliates you so much. I, it, it's a humiliating illness. You lose so much that, that's basic to you. When people are moving around and doing things and being constructive and you can't do it, it's very hard to watch others be the kind of person you saw yourself being before. But you have to find a way to be that person without all the action, without all the moving, without even the brain to work with. And I, my brain is, is very shaky. I, I can fake it sometimes, but sometimes it just goes away from me. Uh, one of the reasons I was so angry with the CDC and always has, have been is they really did not know how to or they chose not to, to look into this illness very well. There are lots of us here in Atlanta who went in and did interviews for them. And it was, that was one of the things that made me know how bad my brain was. Because when I went in, the interviewer told me, that, stopped the interview in the middle and said, we don't know how to find African Americans with this illness. Now, I could do that. I could tell her about 17 different ways to find African Americans with this illness. She took notes, took notes. Then she went back to what she was doing which was testing me. And she said, OK, let's get back to the testing. She clicked the timer and said, name all the words you can think of that begin with the letter A. By the third word, I was making mistakes. When you don't have the brain to work, this poor woman looked at me and, and forgot to turn off the timer at the end of the time. I had to remind her that the bell rang, the time's up, <laughs> because she was staring at me in open mouth astonishment, because I could not get words to begin with the letter A. When you, ha when you lose things on that basic level. You have to really go back and say, OK, this is what I don't have. Let me rem remember what it is that I still am, the person that I still am. I am still the same person. I just cannot do anything remotely like what I used to be able to do. And those two things have to be separate. Otherwise, you will never make it through this illness. <laughs> It'll break your heart too many times. So Roger, yeah, how about you? It's a very hard taskmaster and, and teacher, uh, Leonis. And, and uh, you know, my feeling is that it, it always has that upper hand. You know, I, I, however hard I try, it can uh, mm -hmm. it can uh, take away my abilities any time it uh, <coughs> any time it. Uh, I, I was going to say chooses, but that's given it a personality. <laughs> but any time <laughs> it occurs, um, <coughs> sometimes it feels like it has a personality. <laughs> um, but I, I, I think I, I really resisted. Um, Losing the idea I I had of myself, you know, I as soon as I felt a little bit better, I went back to teaching, and then made myself very much worse by trying to be the person that I used to be, and um, I, you know, I, I couldn't travel anymore the way I used to, but I did make one trip to to Asia and and learned that I can't really do that, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> even, even with 
complicated, you know, elaborate uh, preparation. So it's, I think, you know, what I learned over 20 years is that there's, I can't fight this, that, you know, I, I have to um, accept that well, this is who I am now and not get angry about it, um, mm -hmm. because anger is really, um, you know, it makes me, sends my health down as fast as anything can, and that's, that's sort of intense emotion. So um, try to do as much as I can, and I accept that it's not what I used to be able to do, and I try to um, uh, get as much satisfaction out of what I can do. It's a very much quieter life than I had anticipated. But I also discovered some quiet pleasures that I that I wouldn't have discovered uh, before, and it forced me to do new things that I probably wouldn't have considered, like um, meditation, which I find um, you know slows my brain down and stops me burning up as much energy, and it's just a practical thing. But it also has enabled me to um, you know accept things and not be struggling against things uh, uh, all the time with the same energy. So um, now I think I accept more. I, I, every time I feel better, I want to do more. I never, that never stops. Never stops. And it's, uh, you know, I have to sort of, you know, remind myself, you know, this <laughs> feeling better, you know, it's, it's not going to last. Oh, I think it's going to last. And maybe that, that's a good thing. And I also learned that the times that I really feel better are exactly the times before I crash. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, you know, you, 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 you live within what you can do, and some people, of course, can do uh, very little. I can do quite a few things that I, that, that I enjoy doing, but I lead a, I lead a, a quiet life. I think um, one of the, the harder things for me is that to, I was in a new country, and I didn't and I was move into new places and having to make new lives and um, without knowing anybody. And I think that I, you know, tried to present myself as the old, healthy person um, mm -hmm. because I felt like people, strangers, would not be interested in a sick person. And, and that was um, still how you I, saw yourself. You, you still saw yourself that being the real you, as opposed I, to. I, I don't know. Uh, it, it, it was the it was the me that I wanted to present uh, mm -hmm. to the world. So you sort of orchestrate it. You know, you, mm -hmm. you you lie down a lot, and then you go out and meet people, and you're sort of like a normal person. <laughs> and uh, but I, I I don't know um, if I. If that's really, I think my own identity, um, you know, has taken on the, uh, the the acceptance that's become necessary for me to live with this uh, this illness. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that there is a um, a me that is entirely separable uh, from it. One of the interesting things too to me is to, you talked about anger and anger being one of the things that, that makes you sickest. Is being able, the thing is to have to separate out the anger that comes as why did this happen to me? That the personal kind of anger, and at the right. same time, be willing to stand up to demand fairness for all of those who suffer with this illness. Because that's Absolutely. that's one thing that's important to me. We have been treated so incredibly unfairly by by all of the government agencies who dismissed us. If if they had not dismissed us so thoroughly back when they first started looking at this illness, we would know a lot more now. We might not be well, but we certainly would know a lot more than we did back then. Uh, so many years of dismissal. I, the, the tricky thing is not getting angry about yourself personally, because that does eat you up. If you sit around going, why did this happen to me all day long? I'm, it's not fair. I'm furious. Well, life is not fair. But our government agencies are supposed to be there. They're supposed to look after the welfare of their people. And to, to be willing to stand up and demand that people deal appropriately with the illness without being eaten up by anger yourself is a is a hard line to walk to. It is a it is a hard line, and uh, you know I think that you know seeing injustice and using what energy you have to to try and correct it is um, is, is 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 something that we all have to try to do. Uh, um, I'm not sure it helps us 
do it to uh, to be angry doing it. Um, uh, I think that you know you don't have to be angry to see this there's, no. there's something wrong. And in fact, if you can you know be active and calm, <laughs> you probably I think we're probably more effective than when we're active and angry. Yeah, I, I think I, know not I think we have a perfectly legitimate <laughs> complaint <laughs> here. We don't have. Oh, we certainly do. Yeah. This this has been a, a very poor way to to address a very serious health problem for lots of people, and to, that we can stand up and say that, and insist that that something be done to change that without letting anger eat us alive. Because I refuse to let anger change who I am. I, I, if you let anger yeah. change who you are, then then they've won, <laughs> whether you consider it the illness is won or, or whoever. I'm, I'm not going to change who I am. I'm just going to demand that, that people deal with me and this illness and all of the other people with this illness in a much, much, much better manner. One, you were talking about presenting an image of yourself, Roger. Before we quit, I just had to say I love the scene where you, you were attempting to date as a normal person. That was very amusing. Anyone who hasn't read the book, you got to read that scene. <laughs> <laughs> I, I understood exactly what was going on there. You, I, you had all my sympathies. <laughs> yes, and yes, that's an example of my folly. Yes, <laughs> that was not accepted. I was ill. <laughs> yeah. A couple of people have asked how Roger maintained um, his attractiveness to women <laughs> in spite of his illness. <laughs> <laughs> I won't say whether those questions came from men or from women, but. Um, <laughs> I, I guess the uh, title yeah. of the book somewhat invites that, doesn't it? <laughs> well, uh, you, you know, I, I can't all really women. speak to that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I, I will say that, the, you know, the book uh, from beginning to end covers about 15 years. So though there may seem to be, uh, <laughs> you know, a large number of relationships involved, <laughs> there was, <laughs> you, you know, there was a lot of dead periods there when I was simply on my own as well. But they are not so interesting to write about. And um, so, and uh, you know, actually, I was also interested not just autobiographically about love and being ill, and uh, um, for myself, but I was also interested in in, in looking at other people's experiences mm -hmm. of it as as Americans, and um, you know, where people were in their particular aspect of their pursuit of happiness. Um, so I have I have sort of focused on um, uh, relationships uh, quite, a, quite a lot in the book. Uh, it's, it's, I, I, it's, I found it's that... Uh, writing I, about I, loneliness endlessly just gets, you know, just gets very boring. A little tedious. And it really did give a lot of insight uh, as to, to just how much people do struggle to try to make relationships work without having the facility to work with. I mean, it, things that should be very, very easy just are not easy at all when, when you have this illness. And I think you did a, a beautiful job of making that clear, even amusing sometimes, but also very, very touching and very insightful. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I don't think uh, a lot of the other characters in the book were finding love very easy, even though they were perfectly healthy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're, uh, you know, long over our, our one hour, and we're losing some members of the audience who are leaving um, very regretfully because they're out of energy but not out of interest. Um, so, Roger, before we wrap up, I'd like to just ask uh, you what you might have discovered since the book was published, either about yourself or about CFS. You've written in the past about fictional characters, but this time you decided to tell your own story. And how is that for a writer and an individual to um, experience a reaction to their own story mm -hmm. in such a such a way? Yes, uh, I'm just getting used to that. I, I mean, I, I think writing about you know a very miserable period of your of your life is is, is a, you know really insane to do because then you get to live it twice. Although you do get to um, you know, sort some things out along the way, which is part of the motivation for writing. Now, I'm just, and I'm just getting used to, you know, getting some feedback from uh, from readers now. And I and I really didn't know what the reception of the book would be. I thought it was, you know, a rather experimental novel, and I wasn't sure whether it would be easy to read or not. And it turns out that people seem to find it very easy to read. So I'm very pleased that it's accessible. 
and I'm getting a lot of uh, you know feedback from people saying they had similar experiences, and uh, and actually you know thanking me for for recording their experiences. And mm -hmm. I think that I didn't know how much this book would be become part of the uh, the chronic fatigue community. It's more than I expected. Um, I'm delighted that it has been embraced. I, I think my m main motive w was probably to write a book that, for general readership so that people who don't have any personal contact with the illness would come to understand the illness and understand the difficulties that people have with it and maybe um, support uh, support us in uh, in uh, getting more attention for it and more research for it. But I was I, I was hoping for a general audience, and I hope I, I, I find one. Um, but I'm just uh, very touched by uh, the response I've been getting from fellow sufferers. Um, I would bet the response you're going to get from the general world is I had no idea. People people really do not understand the kind of balancing act and juggling and struggling and falling down and trying to get back up and just the whole effort of getting through life with this illness. As we do try to show our best face forward when we actually get out to the outside world okay. and they have no idea what's going on behind the scenes to get us out there. I think that it, I really thank you for having written this because I, you were you really told everything. You were unsparing of yourself. A lot of, we really do try to cover up sometimes and not talk about some of the things that happen to us and, and you really put it forward and I appreciate that greatly. Well, and you put you. it forward I mean, in I think an the, the challenge is <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the challenge is to make it entertaining, you know. <laughs> yes, <laughs> because it was. it's not an obviously entertaining subject and and it and it's an off putting subject for, for for people who mm -hmm. don't have a prior interest. You know, to get them to put a, pick up a book about being ill is is the, the definite barrier to overcome there. So you have to, you know, try and make it um, a little bit exciting, a little bit funny, and a little bit inter interesting for for people to get past that. Uh, that I, I think I think you did that beautifully. It, it, to me, it didn't come across as a book about being ill as much as it was a book about loss and trying to live. And and that, uh, I think that's you. something that everybody can identify with. Thank you. Uh, I hope that's true, and uh, I'd like to think that's true. Yeah. Thank you, Valamina. And uh, we've had uh, several questions that I've tried to respond to uh, through the little chat box about where to get the book, and um, we'll we'll make an uh, unapologetic plug for Love and Fatigue in America that's available, Roger tells me, in every Barnes & Noble, um, bricks and mortar store, unless it has sold out, and also through the uh, Amazon, BarnesandNoble.com, and and other booksellers as well. Um, also, as an ebook on uh, on Kindle, at least. On Kindle. Do you know somebody yeah. asked about iPad, and I I don't have an iPad, so I don't know how to get books. You know, I don't know whether it's available on iPad, and I meant to find that out. Um, I don't know whether they've done all the ebook formats or just Kindle. Um, so sorry, I can't I can't. Uh, Give the right answer to that. I ought to know, but I but I don't. But it should be uh, available in all bookshops, and if they don't have copies, they can certainly order them and and get them quickly. Okay, somebody's uh, letting us know that it's available on the iPad with the Kindle app. Oh, okay, very good. Well, thank you. Yeah. For that <laughs> yeah better in, better inform than me. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got the fans helping us out, and, and I know you had responded to this on Facebook that there isn't an audio book as of right now, and that's not something you as the author get to uh, dictate, but hopefully it will be available in that format at some time in the future. Yes, and, and is, there some, is there not a way for Kindle to also speak it? I, I, I think there might be, but uh, I, I'm not an expert on that. But yes, I hope there will be a proper audio book in, in time. and. Uh, you know, maybe if it's uh, it does particularly well as a regular book, that will encourage them all the more to do the audio book. Great. Well, um, we've come to the end of an hour and 30 minutes, uh, having planned only an hour, so I thank you both yeah. for indulging us with an extra 30 minutes, and for the audience has largely stayed with us for the whole time. Uh, well, it's thank you for them, and thank you. A, a tribute to um, just really the, the
caliber of the discussion. So I thank you both. Well, thank um, you. It's sort of frustrating knowing all the audiences out there, and I can't yeah. talk to them. <laughs> and we can't include them. But I had several people type messages like, I'm, I'm in tears listening to this. Their experience mirrors so much my own. Um, it sounds like I'm, I'm in a living room with friends and uh, just great oh, outreach, yeah. even, even through this little chat mechanism we have here. Um, and as, as we hope, the recording uh, will take and we'll be able to post that either later today or tomorrow up on our website for those who would like to share it with people who weren't able to participate today. And I've got to hopefully the screen is now showing where to find more information. The um, yeah. webinar page on our researchfirst.com site has links to uh, the reviews of the book and um, both Amazon and Barnes and Noble if you like to order it, um, and we will, as I said, post the recording up there as soon as we have it, and also a sign up Also, uh, I have a website that people can go to for information yeah. as well. And that's linked from our page, but I think it's rogerking.com, if I'm not mistaken. It, rogerking.org, actually. Uh, okay, I'm sorry, rogerking.org. Yeah. Rogerking yeah. And uh, just for those who aren't uh, familiar, we also have uh, two other publications in addition to researchfirst.com and more Research First News, the CFS, Solve CFS print publication, which was just mailed to donors last week. So look for that in your mailbox. Uh, and our Catalyst in Action monthly newsletter uh, that goes out. Um, and just as a reminder, the donations that you make to the association make programs like today's possible. And we are in the midst of our spring fundraising campaign and appreciate any and all uh, donations to help fuel both our research program and programs like this one. So um, it's been my pleasure to host this discussion. And thank you so much, Roger, for your beautiful book and for being with us today. And thank you, Wilhelmina, for your decades of activism um, from the couch and from the living room. And <laughs> from the, the halls of Washington and uh, the CDC. You've attended so many meetings in person and uh, done so much from your home. So thank you for all that over the years. And thank you to our, our gracious audience um, for participating today. And we are pleased to be able to bring these webinars to you in your homes and, and um, to have this mechanism to share this type of conversation with everyone. So I wish everyone a, a pleasant afternoon and a nice rest after the program today and a good rest of your week. Thank you so much for participating and we'll look forward to the next time. Take care. Thank you. Okay.